Good afternoon to all those who are here in the Americas. So we have the pleasure to start our webinar from the uh, Association of Academic Health Centers International, uh, Latin America and Caribbean Regional. So we'll start with Professor Eduardo Krieger to introduce the webinar. Thank you, Professor. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Eduardo Krieger and I am the Executive Director of the International Relations Office of the Medical School, University of Sao Paulo. And in name of our Dean, Professor Tarcísio Pessoa de Barros Filho, I want to welcome all the participants of the web seminar. Webinar. The seminar was organized by the regional office of the Association Academic Health Center uh, by, of Latin America and Caribbean, with the strong support of the Headquarter Association in Washington, namely Professor Stephen Cantor, President and CEO of the organization, Chris Kale Smith, Director of Member Program, and Abibi Osmani, Program Coordinator. Many thanks for all of that. We also thank the competent staff of our office here in our medical school, coordinated by Talita Almeida and integrated by Emily, Douglas, Guilherme, and Clarice. As you know, Brazil and especially the state of Sao Paulo, where we live, have become the hotspot for COVID-19 epidemic. The data that will be presented by Professor Aloysio Segurado will demonstrate. We also discuss, he will also discuss how intensively the pandemic has affected the different activities in our teaching hospital, the Hospital das Clinicas, which is the largest health center in Latin America dedicated to medical education and research, in addition to a system provided to the patients. Of course, many challenges were imposed to medical education, both in the undergraduate course as well in the graduate PhD program new ways of learning, especially remote learning, need to be explored in depth due to the restriction imposed by the pandemic. Professor Milton Arruda will discuss the impact and the alternatives for the undergraduate course. And Professor Luis Felipe Moreira will do the same for the PhD program. Next, Professor Valeria Aoiki will discuss the impact of epidemic on the student mobility, the ongoing and outgoing students. Finally, I want to stress that in this introduction, that the main objective of the seminar is to show how our medical school is doing its best to overcome the challenge and restriction imposed by the pandemic. We do hope that discussion, our experience, will be useful to our colleagues who are working in other institutions of Latin America and Caribbean associated to the Association Academic Health Center and who are facing the same challenges. It is my privilege to call the first speaker, Professor Aluizio Segurado, who is Professor of Infectious Disease in our medical school and President of the International Relation Committee. Please, Professor Aloysio.
Thank you, Professor Krieger and all my colleagues from the Medical School of the University of Sao Paulo. First of all, I would like to greet all the participants of this webinar and to thank the organizers for having invited me. For you to better understand the impact uh, the pandemic has brought about to the medical school and to our institution as a whole, I think I should uh, put you all in context and try to say very briefly in a few words how hard the pandemic has hit Brazil so far and in particular our state in Sao Paulo. As you probably know, uh, international public health authorities have updated data recently on June 15. And according to those figures, Brazil now stands second in the world, both in the number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 and also in the number of deaths, having surpassed all European countries and Asian countries so far. The first Brazilian case was diagnosed on February the 25th, and that was a 60-year-old man who was returning from a business trip to Italy. After that, numbers never stopped to increase, as you see in this graph, and we can very clearly understand uh, the steep rise of the curve that has a, that is about to reach its plateau, as we uh, currently understand. We, have, we, cannot, we cannot make sure this is the peak, and because we still have to wait for the following weeks to come to see what the trend will be in terms of number of, of cases. However, the overall number of cases is closely reaching 1 million cases, uh, taking into account the fact that we still have an underestimate due to lack of overall testing, and the number of deaths have already exceeded 40,000. In the, the state of Sao Paulo has been the, where we are experiencing the hardest situation, as you see from here, and the city of Sao Paulo, the great metropolitan area of Sao Paulo, represents most of those cases, over half of those cases. The, the curve is still going up uh, so that we cannot still see to, uh, when we'll reach the peak and when the, the trend is going to be reversed. According uh, to these, in, under this epi situation, our institution was challenged to give a quick response and we were very happy to have had previous experiences in facing other disasters and national tragedies and having constituted a, a crisis committee management, a crisis management committee in 2013. The, com the committee had been previously put together in a number of other occasions. For instance, in the yellow fever outbreak we had a couple of years ago, when we had a mass shooting in one school, in one elementary school in the city of Sao Paulo, and a large number of school kids had to be brought to the, our emergency room. And so the infrastructure, infrastructure was still there, was already there to put this committee back into action once again. We did that over one month before the first case of COVID-19 was diagnosed in the city. What gave us time to structure, to put together an emergency operational plan. It's important for you to understand that we are, as Professor Krieger mentioned, the largest academic health center in Latin America. That includes not only the medical school, but also the School of Nursing, the School of Public Health, and at least eight specialized medical institutes, which are brought together under this umbrella of the Hospital das Clinicas complex, you see in this picture. The system has altogether over 2,400 beds, 
and is distributed in the same neighborhood in the central area of the city of Sao Paulo. It also hosts the busiest emergency room in the city that receives about 42,000 emergency admissions every year and admits about 14,000 patients every year. A very tough decision had then to be made how to continue providing tertiary high complexity care to patients who seek us from all over the state or even the country or even from other fo neighboring foreign countries while having the need to respond to the emerging epidemic of COVID-19. A very hard decision was then made to designate one full hospital for COVID-19 patients, putting all the other services in other facilities to better control cross-contamination, to protect our healthcare staff and patients with other diseases while providing the maximum, the maximum of beneficial outcomes for patients with COVID-19. The emergency operational plan was launched on January the 29th, separating hospital facilities in COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 areas with the special requirement of not allowing personnel mobility between the COVID-19 and the non-COVID-19 areas. Our busy emergency room had to be dismantled and moved to other institutes, and this was only possible by having all the other complex institutes taking part in this huge effort. In this slide, you see how many different institutes were uh, involved in, the, in transferring all the services, the emergency services, so that the central institute, as we name it here in yellow, would be exclusively dedicated to COVID-19 care. Of course, many of these emergency teams had to be split in two or three because part of the specialists had to move to the other institutes to be in charge of non-COVID patients with emergencies while some of them were left behind because patients with COVID-19 can also be victims of other conditions and can have emergency conditions to be dealt with. Likewise, our inpatient wards in the Central Institute were moved to six different hospitals, again, in a huge solidarity that was achieved among all colleagues. Starting from March the 30th, we have finally had the Central Institute as a completely designated facility for COVID-19 care that would be able to provide not only wards in beds in wards, but also intensive care unit beds. Starting to set up those COVID-19 areas was not an easy task. Care facilities had to be completely re-engineered. And of course, a lot of logistical issues had to play their roles such as bringing together medical staff, including faculty, assistant physicians, and medical residents, multi-professional health teams, including mainly nursing staff and physiotherapists, building all the necessary infrastructure, providing adequate stocks of PPEs, of personal protective equipment, for those who would be working in the front lines and also providing all the support that was needed. This meant re-engineering the space, having to transform areas from their original use to get them adapted for the emergency. Just for as an example, 
you can see on the top left side of this slide, one of our operating rooms, how it looked like in January 2020. And at the bottom right, you see this emergency operating room transformed into an ICU that would hold four beds for critically ill patients with all the equipment and ventilators that are, that are necessary to assist those patients, including may, uh, many times dialysis machines. Just for you to have an idea, we have been receiving a large number of critically ill patients that require mechanical ventilation and therefore intubation, many of which, many of whom also develop re renal failure needing dialysis replacement therapy. Our operating theater was completely transformed. This is what used to be the corridor of the operating theater that leads to the different operating rooms fully transformed into a nursing and medical staff station for uh, the for to give the, the personnel access to electronic records to results of lab tests and everything that is needed to provide medical care in addition many of the origin, original wards had also to be adapted for intensive care. Since their architectural infrastructure was not designed as an ICU, we had to set up cameras to allow moni continuous monitoring of patients in different rooms from the nursing station in order to reduce the number of times the staff had to enter those rooms to monitor clinical parameters that are necessary to provide care. This transformation took a while, as you can see here. At the beginning, the State Health Department asked us to be ready to have 100 ICU beds. We started with about 80 ICU beds at the end of March. Later on, we were summoned to double that capacity to 200 ICU beds. And finally, we were asked to scale it up again for 300 ICU beds besides about 500 ward beds. This is our current capacity. And as you can see in the, in, the, in, the, in the blue lines, as soon as the beds were made available, they were immediately occupied. Our patients are referred to our hospital under the coordination of a state referral integrated network where professionals from different health services in the city feed up uh, information about patients who need referral and we can then select those whose profiles better meet the conditions of care we can provide. And you, as you can see here uh, in this graph, this is the number of referral requests that were logged in the system according a long time. And as you can see, this is the cumulative number and this is the daily number. It, it started going up at the beginning of April and, and now it seems it has reached this plateau of about 600 referral requests per day. Our hospital uh, was in charge, as you can see here, of taking most of those requests. In orange, we see patients who needed ICU care, and in, in blue, patients who could be assisted or taken care of in wards. As you can see here, from the very beginning of the pandemic, we had about half patients needing intensive care, 
as compared to those who didn't need that. And in comparison to other hospitals in Sao Paulo, you can see the number of patients we were able to admit is, is much larger than any other hospital in the city, particularly if we take into consideration patients needing intensive care, which meets uh, the characteristics of a tertiary high complexity academic health center. Our hospitalization since the beginning of the operation are shown on this graph. And until yesterday, we had already admitted about 3,000 patients, 70% of whom have already been discharged and sent back home after recovery, what makes us very happy. I would like to tell you that this is something I had never experienced before in my life. And I, I, I'm sure no one in the institution has ever had such an experience. It was, it was an inspiring experience of solidarity, of institutional commitment, having an academic health center responding very quickly to the demands of the health, public health authorities to take care of a situation that might have gone under out of control if we hadn't been able to put the operation uh, in March. And therefore, I finish my presentation uh, praying my gratitude to all the members of our hospital COVID-19 crisis management committee, to all members of multi-professional healthcare teams who have been in these couple of months completely devoted to the care of these severely ill patients, to all faculty attending physicians and medical students, many of them who have volunteered to be part of this solidarity effort. Thank you very much. Professor Krieger, I'm afraid you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Hello? There you go. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor LaLuisa, for the nice presentation. The next speaker will be Milton, Professor Milton Arruda Martins, who is the Professor of Internal Medicine and President of the Educational Committee of our medical school. Hello everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm going to talk about the changes we had to do in our undergraduate programs to face the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm going, I'm going to, to talk about changes in our undergraduate programs about volunteering and about some lessons uh, uh, from uh, this pandemic. Uh, there was a huge challenge for us. Uh, the need of social distancing resulted in interruption of all activities of the first to fourth years medical students. Our, our undergraduate program is a six year program and we have 180 medical students per year. The, the, the last two years, uh, we call, it, call them internships. And the interns of the fifth year had also to stop their activities. Only activities of students of the sixth year were not suspended. 
After two weeks of rapid preparation of faculty and students, all teaching of the first to fourth years uh, were transitioned to online formats. This was a big challenge. Uh, move everything to online in only two weeks. The same transition was necessary in other uh, of our undergraduate courses, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech and hearing therapy. For the transition to online educa education, it was very important to have a strong support uh, from the Center for Development of Medical Education. Uh, it's very important for medical schools to have a center like ours. Uh, this center has people who does faculty development and innovation and research in medical education. To make the transition to online education, we used multiple strategies, synchronous and asynchronous classes, small group interactions, flipped classroom, and clinical cases discussion. We also considered very important to give support to students with vulnerable socioeconomic status. We gave them computers, internet cards and financial aids, aids so we, they could follow the online activities. We, we have a an, an mentorship program that we transformed in an online mentorship program and also a program of mental health support and assistance. assistance. And we also uh, developed a lot of activities to keep the students connected to medical school. Keep people connected is very important in a situation like this one. One example was a photograph contest and we asked the, uh, our medical students to send us pictures from their windows, a look through my window. More than 100 medical students uh, sent pictures. And these are one, uh, some of the pictures that uh, we consider, uh, consider the best ones. We also developed a program of volunteering uh, for medical schools. This program started uh, at the end of March and the medical students could choose among the care of COVID-19 patients, the care of other patients, or to, to, to help in research and teaching activities. We had 300 students that wanted to be volunteers. They were medical students from the fourth to the sixth year. And also we had students from other health professions. Uh, they worked in, in our two teaching hospitals, the clinics hospital that Professor Aluizu uh, already talked about, and also in our uh, second hospital that's a, a community hospital, uh, our university hospital. For the volunteering program, uh, we started giving them appropriate training, continuous supervi supervision, and also personal protective equipment. And we did not let them undertake any activity beyond their level of competency. But uh, we believe that this program is very important because it can influence the development of professional values and identity. Uh, to, to work as a volunteer uh, in the care of people in this, in this health, health crisis uh, can reinforce important values of health professions, such as altruism, service in times of crisis, solidarity with the profession, 
disposition to serve the society. So we, we did not believe that medical students had to stay at home. We, we believe in the opposite, that medical students uh, must be involved in the care of, of, of patients uh, and also in COVID-19 patients. And this participation uh, can influence, influence very positively uh, the, the formation of the development of the professional identity. When we asked the medical students about their motivation to, to work as volunteer, altruism was the main response. 44% of medical students uh, decided to be volunteers because of altruism or, or altruistic feeling. 37% uh, because of sense of duty. I must help uh, people. And only 19% decided to be volunteers to learn something about, about care of patients. And the areas of volunteering uh, also very, uh, were very diverse. Care of COVID-19 patients, care of non-COVID-19 patients, but also epidemiological and research works uh, as well as, as helping with teaching and administrative responsibilities. Finally, what we think uh, are some lessons to, to learn for the future of the teaching of health professions. It's, it's very difficult to look for the future. I don't have this ball. But uh, everybody who works with medical education around the world uh, is, has, has been discussing about the future. What we have learned, one thing that's very important, that we, 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 we are not afraid of online strategies anymore. Online strategies in undergraduate health professions education can help. The future of uh, health professions education will be a mix between online and also care of patients, uh, laboratories, and, and activities that, that require the presence of, of the student, the presence of the students. But we, we need also to, to think and to talk more about what's essential for teaching and learning in medical school, about faculty development programs, uh, teachers uh, needed creativity, flexibility, and resilience to, to make a strong collaboration between medical students and faculties, to increase the programs of financial and academic support to underprivileged students, and to put health needs of the society as the core of the curriculum. But we have also lessons uh, that concern uh, the, the whole of, of physicians and the health professions in the world. The COVID-19 epidemic re reminds us about the need of sustainable development, of the increase of programs of global health, and to increase the formation of our physicians in evidence-based practice. A lot of physicians and also politicians around the world recommended uh, treatments that were against the evidences. And so go back to evidence-based practice is very, very important for the future of medical education. And also uh, remember about the, the work to decrease social inequalities COVID-19 pandemic was not democratic. It, uh, it reached more the underserved uh, people, the poor populations, the elderly, 
in Brazil, the people in indigenous areas. Uh, we, in Brazil, it's very important the existence of our national health system, the Sistema Unico de Saúde. Without SUS, it, will be, it would be a tragedy in Brazil. And also, uh, remain the importance of interprofes interprofessional education and collaborative practice. The care of COVID-19 pandemic is a, a group work, is a, a health team work. Nobody can, could do it alone. Thank you for all doctors and health teams that are working in the care of our patients in Brazil and in the world. And thank you every, everybody for your attention. Thank you, Professor Milton, for this exciting presentation. And the next speaker will be Professor Luis Felipe Moreira, who is Professor of Cardiac Surgery and also Vice President of the Graduate Committee of our Medical School. Please, Professor Luis Felipe. Okay, dear colleagues, everyone, I'd like to thank you, the organizers, to invite me to participate at this exciting web meeting. It is a great pleasure to stay here and to have the opportunity to talk about the challenges that we are facing in the graduation programs of the Faculty of Medicine of Sao Paulo University due to COVID-19 pandemic situation. I will start talking a little bit about our graduation system. The graduation system of the Faculty of Medicine of Sao Paulo University is a system based on the binomial mentor-student. To graduate new scientists in the field of health sciences willing to produce high quality scientific information and innovative, innovative technical advancements. They are students from different school graduations willing to be in academics that will work with an available mentor under var variable specific demands. The graduation system was created in 1970 and conferred the first degrees in 1976. Since then, we had more than 10,000 defenses in master or doctoral levels. At present, we currently have 29 different programs in both master and do doctoral degrees that involve with approximately 650 academic mentors and 2,400 students. The 29 graduation programs include all the different areas of health sciences, including public and preventive health, rehabilitation sciences, infectious disease, tropical medicine, and specific med uh, medical specialties like cardiology, gastroenterology, psychiatry, and so on. They were basically founded by uh, governmental agencies, especially uh, GAPS, CNPQ, and FAPESP, and these agencies are normally responsible for grants for students and for research support. During this time, some of these agencies uh, started to uh, maintain the grants for students for a longer period and to sustain their cap uh, capacity to follow their uh, graduation uh, programs. In the last years, we have around 2,000 students divided between the different programs and mainly concentrated in the doctoral formation level. The number of the students looking to obtain the doctoral degree are normally two times more the number of students at the master level. This situation is probably related to the high number of medical doctors that we have between our students. 
the number of conclusions in the master level that lasts two or three years to be finished varied between 170 and 200 in the last years. The time of the doctoral formation is normally around four years and we had more than 250 doctoral thesis defense in the most of the years. Well, we can talk a little bit about how the graduation system works and the graduation formation in both master and doctoral degree normally include disciplines and scientific seminars about scientific concepts and specific aspects of the scientific knowledge related to the different research areas. Also of fundamental importance is the research development of the specific pr projects conducted under the supervision of the mentors. During the last years, most of these activities were conducted face to face. We had 166 disciplines in different uh, in-class course, varying from one to several days in, 19, uh, in 2019, while only eight disciplines were performed online and with distance learning methods. The research activities also were also normally performed as in-class periodic meetings and face-to-face -face clinical, laboratorial, and field activities. Therefore, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we had a great impact on all our activities. Several strategies were included to uh, maintain the graduation system and to maintain our students' participation, despite the necessity to avoid the personal contact and to maintain most of the involved uh, people at home. The disciplines and scientific seminars had to be performed only online and with distance learning methodologies. Most of the clinical, laboratorial, field activities related to research development were suspended and delayed. Most of uh, our lab facilities were now, uh, are now involved in the COVID-19 support for the hospital and therefore most of the activities of research had to be really uh, suspended and delayed as I told. Nevertheless, this period introduced the challenge to change several things, including to change learning and teaching methodologies and to provide technical and personal support for the new online activities. We had, in reality, strategies uh, related to the disciplines and scientific seminars and we can see that we had the opportunity to maintain only 27 disciplines conducted online during the period of, between March and June this year. We have more other, uh, other uh, 50 scholarship activities suspended at the same time. And it was really impossible at the beginning of this period to really have all the uh, mentors and uh, professors involved, especially in the graduation system, because they have other uh, things to uh, work, including in the graduation system, in the, uh, in also in the hospital facilities and uh, so on. Basically, for the second part of the year, we, can, uh, we had the opportunity to prepare a more strong uh, process. And we have at least two times more online disciplines programmed for uh, the next month. And we, we are working heavily to provide the necessary knowledge about the, dist about the dis distance learning techniques for most of our mentors. 
we are starting a program to train our mentors to work with uh, these uh, techniques with also the support of some of our graduate students. The qualification exams and the master and doctoral thesis defenses also had to be postponed and performed by online meeting, which was also a challenge because very few defenses were normally performed as uh, an online meeting or as a hybrid in-person online event in the last years. We already developed this possibility, by, but very few uh, defenses occurred. And now, most of our students and mentors preferred to postpone the defenses. And we had this year only 16 defenses in person events of master defense and 47 uh, doctoral defenses also as in person events before the time of uh, uh, the uh, social uh, challenge uh, to maintain people uh, outside uh, the center. And now, after this period, in the last three months, we had just 14 online events for master defense and 20 doctoral defense, showing that the number decreased a lot. And most of our students and also uh, mentors, close to 60 uh, to 50% in reality, tried, uh, tried to postpone the defenses during this period. It was already offered by the university to have a, an automatic delay of each period of defense for all the students. Another important point was the student's international mobility. That includes short duration visits to different research centers around the world and the doctoral sandwich programs, some of them associated with a double degree graduation. This student's international mobility was severely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. We had in 2019, 38 sandwich uh, students, uh, sandwich programs with students sent abroad to participate in doctoral programs and uh, in uh, research in other centers in uh, uh, different countries. And 14 short duration visits also performed by our students. Besides, several exchange visits performed by our mentors and also by foreign professors that came to visit our institution for periods varying from weeks to several months. Regarding the international mobility of our students in uh, 2020, only seven students were capable to maintain their sandwich programs in different centers in North America and Europe. Ten students had to cancel their trips and the proposed research mobility. Finally, new applications for graduate students' international mobility were totally interrupted up to the end of this year, clearly showing that it is probably the most uh, critical and compromised part of the graduate program of our institution. Despite all these problems that uh, we had to face during the pandemic situation, very, several things we had to change to adapt to face it and, and to maintain some of our activities. And they will, of course, positively influence our future strategies. Besides the gradual return of the clinical, laboratorial, and field research activities that we can expect for the next months, we can expect to increase the number of online and distance learning activities 
he placed in some of the in-class disciplines. The incorporation of online periodic scientific meetings between the mentors and the students as a normal practice. And, and also have an increased number of master and doctoral thesis defense made as an hybrid in person online events or even only in online events. All, the, all these teams will collaborate to open new perspectives in the teaching and learning process and also in the research development clearly collaborating as well to improve the internationalization of our system. I thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss with you about uh, this uh, problem and about what uh, we can see for the future in our graduation thesis. Thank you for all. Uh, Professor Krieger, you're Hello. currently muted. Apologies. <laughs> Professor Krieger, you're still muted. Hello. Yes. Thank you. Do you mind reintroducing our last speaker for this webinar? Professor Krieger? Yeah? Could you uh, reintroduce our last speaker for this webinar since we had a bit of audio uh, issues? Okay. The, Thank you. Our next last speaker will be Professor Valeria Awoki, Professor of Dermatology and Vice President of the International Relations Committee of our medical school. Please, Valeria. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. So the last talk will be focusing on incoming and outgoing mobility uh, of our medical students. And from all the problems that we discussed before, I think mobility is uh, one of the most uh, relevant ones because we cannot do uh, virtual mobility. Unfortunately, it's very difficult. So. Uh, let's uh, introduce to you uh, what kind of international relations we have at our medical school. We are part of the uh, international members of the WHHCI and we are the current uh, headquarters of the Latin American and Caribbean Regional Office. And we also belong to the M8 Alliance uh, that extends uh, all this international uh, relation with many uh, different educational institutions. So what do we offer in terms of income and mobility? Uh, basically, we have three branches. We have first, uh, the electives that last from one to three months. And the student here, uh, he can do observation uh, in clinical routine, diagnostic procedures, surgery, ward rounds, outpatient clinics, lectures, and full access to uh, the library system of our university. Portuguese skills here, uh, they, if they have it, it, it's helpful, but it depends because it's only observation. So uh, if they handle Spanish or English, they can do it very well. So the second model we have, it's internship. For this one, uh, the student needs Portuguese skills, uh, B2 level or higher. Uh, why? Because as an intern, uh, he has to deal with the patients, right? So uh, they usually do in the, during the fifth year of medical school and it lasts about six months. Uh, we extend this uh, rotations also for physiotherapy, speech and occupational therapy, which are also part of 
uh, one of the departments here uh, at USP. Uh, incoming mobilities. Uh, the third uh, model that we have is Winter Schools, which is a very successful program that happens uh, during the two weeks of July. We have already run five editions uh, with a lot of success. About 300 students joined the program. A very competitive selection, 65 institutions. Many of them belong to the, uh, Amer the academic health centers and also M8 alliances. And 23 countries so far participated in this program. Uh, this is a nice one because uh, many different students from different institutions, they are uh, at the medical school at the same time. So integration here is awesome. Uh, some uh, of uh, the partner institutions send students uh, during all the five editions, uh, especially King's College, uh, Universidad de Guadalajara, Reningen, Michigan, Desarrollo, Harvard, Caetano uh, Redio, Ljubljana, Columbia, and Hopkins. And interestingly, uh, those students, they arrived here for the first time for winter schools, and later on, uh, some of them returned to our medical institution applying for electives. And I know that some uh, also applied for residency, uh, especially among the Latin American uh, students. So it's a very successful program. So what happens to the impact for incoming mobility during COVID crisis, a total disaster? Why? Uh, the graphs show the results. So if you see here, the first one uh, regards to winter schools. So if you, if you consider uh, winter schools, uh, here they, they have uh, all over the five editions, we have about more than 100 applicants and about 60 students per year. This year we had 147 applicants, but due to COVID, nothing really happened. They were canceled. So over time, the general uh, income mobility, including uh, the electives, uh, they were increasing uh, over time. And this year, from all the 131 applicants, we could only confirm 33. And among this 33, uh, here, only 17 uh, could effective uh, made the mobility. Why? Because they were already here in the country before the pandemic. Uh, and they were from, uh, especially from Europe, UK, uh, Latin America, Middle East and Africa. And it was a very challenging situation because some of the students had to return to their countries, but the borders were closed. So this is really, uh, this was terrible, very difficult. And look, uh, what a pity, 98 uh, canceled mobilities, uh, including uh, Asia and Oceania. So very sad. Uh, what about outgoing? Do we send uh, students abroad? Yes, we do. And how does it work? Twice a year we have uh, applicants, so we have a very competitive uh, process. Uh, usually the top students get those positions uh, and they vary from 42 to 62 per year. And they usually receive scholarships uh, either from their origin uh, receptors there, uh, Erasmus scholarships in Europe, for instance, and here in Brazil, some foundations like the Lemon Foundation or some banks like Santander, they give the, the students uh, some uh, conditions to go. And we have uh, a permanent Harvard collaboration. So 15 students per year go to Harvard with scholarships and stay there for a year. Uh, and fortunately, 14 out of the 27 possible outgoing mobilities at the beginning of this year uh, happen. And the students are in Harvard, but still they're struggling a lot to, all to this pandemic situation, right? So for the second term, we have uh, six uh, outgoing mobilities so far but everything is still on hold. So some confirm, but it all depends on the pandemic uh, evolution. Uh, so I'm just finishing here. Uh, these are some references that I consider them uh, useful uh, regarding COVID-19, implications on clinical clerkships, residency, e-learning programs, medical students, and the need uh, for preparing them for pandemics. 
uh, peer teaching, and even prejudice toward Asian medical students for us to reflect. And I would like to finish acknowledging uh, all the lecturers from today, uh, the moderators, and the help of the Association of Academic Health Centers, especially from DC, Mrs. Smith, uh, Osmani, Talit Tomita representing our regional office and all our collaborators. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria. I don't know how much time we have, if we have time for discussion. Otherwise, I will ask Professor Aluizio, our president, to make the final remarks. And maybe you have no Aviva, time for can, can you help us with that? How long? Yes. Uh, I've, I've informed the attendees that we will go over time. Um, and we still have quite a few on with us. So we have three questions in the Q&A right now that we can answer um, from you, our panelists. Okay, thank you very much. So this is very exciting, the fact that we still have a lot of people participating. What gives me uh, the conclusion that this is a, a stimulating talk and that there are few more issues to cover. So first, we have heard here from Asim that this is really a wealth of information. How helpful this can be for crisis management in other institutions. And I'm, I understand that we are being convinced we should put this all together into a publication because this experience is something that can really be useful to other institutions that are getting prepared or even facing similar problems or even facing the uncertainties of the future. We are now entering a new era of uncertainties that might bring us again in a similar situation. So thank you for, this, uh, for your comment. This is really inspiring and I hope all the panelists will join me in this effort of putting this together into a publication. There is a question here uh, for Professor Martins uh, about volunteer students. What are the guidelines that were followed? Because our colleague Rosana from Peru says uh, they were forbidden to get students back to hospital during the pandemic. So what were the guidelines, Professor Martins, you were following? that enabled you bringing everyone on board? Uh, there are, thank you for your question. Uh, in many countries, uh, medical schools or medical schools associations uh, give incentives for medical students to, to be volunteers. It was not forbidden. Uh, the American Association of Medical Colleges, the Medical Association of schools of medicine of the United Kingdom, for example, uh, had guidelines for volunteering. And in Brazil, it's also, it was not forbidden. We think that the participation of medical students as volunteers is very helpful for the formation of their uh, professional identity. Of course, all these associations recommend personal protective equipment, supervision, training, but we, uh, here in Brazil, we, we stimulate medical students to, 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 to in, engage themselves in volunteering uh, activities. Okay, thank you, Professor Martins. There is a question here I would like to address. Our colleague, Ali Karshanas, is saying that she had, oh, that it's being announced, uh, brought, by many international news agencies that report that deaths in Brazil due to COVID-19 might be underreported due to the fact that the government is trying to minimize uh, the significance of the pandemic. Thank you for this question because it gives me the opportunity of sharing with you our anxieties. It is so hard for everyone to face a pandemic of this magnitude anywhere in the world. If you have an articulate uh, organization with participation of different stakeholders, what can you say 
if we are under a context when we have the federal government that is denying evidence-based information and that is uh, proposing measures and initiatives that go fully against any international recommendations of public health international organisms or even with sci uh, against scientific evidence. This is really something very hard to cope with. Uh, we, have, we are very fortunate though, though to have, as Professor Martins have very importantly highlighted, to have a, a national health system, a unified health system that gives every Brazilian citizen and every foreign citizen in the country the right to medical care, to comprehensive medical care. And of course, this includes epi surveillance. And under the umbrella of our national health system, we have a hierarchical division of responsibilities that give the states and municipalities their share of responsibility. This was critical because uh, having that, we were able to continue with very important initiatives in public health uh, under state supervision and municipal supervision, even if they were going against recommendations of the federal government. And we had a very important positioning of the Supreme Court that reinforced the autonomy of states and municipalities to carry on their tasks regardless of the recommendations of the federal government. So even though the, the federal government is trying to make our lives even worse or even more difficult, I think we are doing our best uh, to go try to pass through the hard times of the pandemic and the a coalition of state health departments has enabled epi surveillance to be continuously and successfully updated and another coalition of the press agents newspapers tv channels and radios has given us the chance to broadcast and disseminate consolidated uh, realistic epi figures so uh, this is what we have for now uh, we hope we can continue going through this because the hard times have not passed yet, but uh, we are fully committed, committed to face the pandemic united with the collaboration of states and municipalities. Let me see if we have any other questions. Okay, so now we have a question here that can uh, be for either Luis Felipe or Milton. It has to do with assessment and evaluation. So how can we do this uh, online, virtually? Uh, assessment of undergraduate students who are following uh, distance learning programs and also qualifying graduate students. Who would like to start answering the question? I can start. Uh, thank you for the question because assessment of students is a critical issue when you we go from to we put everything online but if you teach online it's logical to assess also online but it must be a compromise compromise among student honesty and uh, new ways of assessment and we can do it. And it's important to, to say that it's, we are in a, a, a terrible crisis. We, we, we must be creative, we must be resilient, and we must uh, develop a strong collaboration between teachers and students. And everybody must understand that we, we have to develop a new ways of student assessment. And we have a lot of years ahead to correct the, the, what we, we couldn't do very well now. 
Thank you. Filippi, would you like to add any comments to that? In regard to the student's assessment, I think that uh, Professor Martins uh, made the most important points. In reality, looking for the graduate system, it's more easy to work uh, with uh, uh, the collaboration of the students, including in the disciplines and uh, in the seminars, uh, scientific seminars. But it's obvious that we need to start to learn new techniques, new uh, ideas to really offer the possibility to a quite nice evaluation for what we are doing in these disciplines and uh, seminars, workshops, etc. And uh, there, are, there is a, a lot of new technologies regarding the online evaluation that we need uh, to include to aid uh, mainly uh, especially for the graduate system, the uh, preparation of special uh, works and uh, performances related to different uh, aspects of the research uh, field. I think that uh, it's still a challenge, but as uh, Professor uh, Martins told, uh, we are learning and improving also in this field for the future. Okay, so we now have a new question uh, that uh, regards medical education, and that has to do with our ability to teach clinical skills. Is it possible to teach clinical skills online, or do we have to keep that task postponed to a later date after the pandemic is controlled? Something must be postponed. So it's uh, <laughs> medical school will never be an online program. So we, we need some adaptations, but some skills we can stimulate online, uh, like uh, clinical reasoning. You can you can do clinical sections online, but to learn how to 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 care the care of patients it must be postponed unfortunately this is what our uh, residency programs in surgery are complaining the most about they do, they are not having residents in in the surgical areas are not having the chance to practice since most of the elective surgeries were postponed so, of course, this has to be uh, left for another uh, occasion when this is resumed. I, if I may, I would like to ask Professor Aoki a question. And my question uh, would be concerning internationalization. Is that the post-COVID-19 era is going to continue for a long time with hard times uh, in terms of re travel restrictions. So I would like to ask you to comment on how can we keep the internationalization of our programs without any travel? Is that possible or not? Um, I think it's possible, but as uh, the former professor's comment, uh, I think it's, it will be in incomplete because uh, besides the scientific approach, uh, we have the cultural, uh, the experience, the living experience. This we will lack, but it's still very possible and we're thinking of doing that. Uh, we, like, I'm a dermatologist, <laughs> we see with the eyes. So uh, like in, in our specialty, it's not impossible, it's not the ideal, but it's possible. So in some areas, I think uh, we have to find a way to keep this going. Uh, and definitely we'll, we'll find out a way to do it. Yeah, I fully agree with you. I, I, I think maybe we have never had so many international virtual meetings as we are having a, along this pandemic. So the possibilities of interacting with people in other countries has been magnified during the crisis. So uh, of course, crises are always times we can take as opportunities for enhancement, for innovation, and we should be 
uh, try to start thinking a, a little bit more of how to keep our programs internationalized, even if we are going to keep having travel restriction in the near future. We have a new question here about uh -huh. the competencies. So the acquisition of competencies. And the question is again, can we believe virtual students will have the same competencies as students who were trained at the way we did before? Of course not. They will not. But we are in a special situation. So the alternative was to do nothing. So medical schools in many countries this decided to, to keep going, to doing something. But we, we have been evaluating the, the online programs and we have very good news that there was a lot of good news. Uh, uh, many, many students are very happy with the online teaching, although many practical uh, lessons must be postponed. We, we are not proposing a, a, a virtual doctor or virtual students, mm -hmm. only we, we are trying to, to, do, to do something and we could do a lot of things during one semester or even one year. And we are, we are hoping that the best scientists in the world will discover a treatment or a vaccine. So otherwise, we, we will we'll have to wait a lot until, until we continue our medical courses. Thank you. We have a question here. I think I will take myself. And the question is regarding the residency programs. How much were they affected by the crisis? I would say, I first have to say that our academic health center is one of, if not the largest, one of the largest residency training centers in the country. We have about 1600 medical residents and we offer residency training programs in all the medical special, specialties that are accredited in the country. So this was a huge challenge, how to keep this going. As I told you, we had to, we, our design was to separate hospital operation, dividing it in, in between a, a COVID-19 fully designated hospital and other uh, hospitals of the complex taking care of non-COVID-19 patients. So well, residents were also split. Some of them were summoned to give their share uh, in, in terms of solidarity, compassion, and uh, an altruistic effort to join efforts for, to take care of those COVID-19 patients. So this was a lesson I had, I will never forget in my life. We had medical wards and ICUs with COVID-19 patients where we would have simultaneously residents in orthopedics, internal medicine, surgery, dermatology, ophthalmology, sports medicine, and so forth. So these joint teams worked together in full solidarity, of course, under the supervision of very skilled assisting physicians and faculty, and with the support of specialized teams in difficult airway access, in catheter insertion, dialysis, Mechanic, mechanical ventilation and all the difficult issues in the care involved in the care of those COVID-19 patients. But it was very encouraging and rewarding to listen from the residents that they were working together, having a dermatology resident working with an orthopedic resident and an ophthalmology resident in a ward where patients had uh, problems with breathing and uh, the, sometimes the need to be intubated and transferred to an ICU to get mechanical, mechanical ventilation support. So this is something I think I, I will never forget and I'm sure the residents themselves will keep forever. This idea of working together, of sharing 
compassion, solidarity in the benefit of those who need it most. The other point is that, of course, as Professor Martins has already highlighted, uh, training skills are missing. Some of these residents could not operate on the many patients they should have operated on during this period. And we still don't know how long it will take us to have the full movement back in terms of the surgical activity of our hospital complex. So a number of initiatives are being designed how to replace that and give them the chance of uh, getting back what they might have lost. Of course, this has, is not fully developed, but of course, it will depend on how advanced those residents are in their training. If they are in their first year or second year of residency, they still have time enough to catch up in the following years to come. But if they are in the final year of their, of their training, they might need an extension. And we are now working on how this is extension is going to be. And the same thing also applies Maybe Professor Martins would like to comment. For the undergraduate students, we still don't know when they can be back to the laboratories, to the clinical settings fully, and to uh, the classrooms. Uh, we still ha have to figure that out in, in, in the next future. So what, do you have any plans for the return of the academic activities next semester or maybe uh, at the beginning of next year, Professor Martins. The, I think that the return to normal life, unfortunately, will be slow, and we we must we must adapt to it. Uh, probably in São Paulo, in the second semester, uh, medical students will allow it to to be to be at the medical school, but only a small percentage of these students. So we, we will have to combine online education with presential education and continually evaluating what's going to happen uh, to figure out if we, we will need an extension of the program or we, we will not. Uh, it's 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 very very difficult to 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 be sure right now about about the future. Okay, so I think we have come to the limit of our time. Uh, I would like to thank again all the panelists for the extraordinary presentations they have had, and for our very attentive audience who have. Brought, brought so many interesting questions that allowed us to explore in deeper detail some of the important issues. I would like to thank again uh, the Association of Academic Health Centers International Branch and the Latin American Branch in particular. Thank you, Professor Aoki, our leader in Latin America, and Talita Almeida for her continued support. Thank you. Uh, Habiba for your support, technical support and continuous effort in putting this together. I think this was a very nice initiative. Uh, thank you, P Professor Krieger, for being an inspiration to us all. Thank you very much and have you all a, a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.